can get us started now. Okay. Good evening, a good afternoon, good morning. Uh, welcome to this panel discussion, AI 2041, uh, 10 visions for, uh, the, the subtitle is 10 visions for our future. So my name is uh, Xiaoning Lu. I'm a reader in modern Chinese culture and language at the SOAS University of London. I'm delighted to welcome our panelists today. So I'm going to introduce them one by one. The, our first guest is Chen Qiufan, also known as Stanley Chan. Uh, Stanley Chan is an award-winning Chinese speculative, speculative fiction writer, translator, creative producer, and a curator. He is honorary president of the Chinese Science Fiction Writers Association and serves on the X Prize Foundation Science Fiction Advisory Council. Stanley has written many Chinese science fiction, including Waste Tide, Huang Chao in Chinese. And today we are going to talk about his latest science fiction, his work. This is a result of his collaborative project with AI expert and a former president of Google China, Li Kaifu or Kaifu Li. Um, so our second speaker is an early career researcher, Mia Chen Ma. She is a PhD candidate at the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures here at the SOAS University of London. She also co-directs the London Science Fiction Research Community. Her PhD project, which is funded by the University's China Com Committee in London, investigates how science fiction functions as a way of thinking about other fields, such as ecology, urbanism, and politics in contemporary Chinese context. Our third panelist, is Dr. Virginia L. Kong. She is a lecturer in the humanities at the Stevens Institute of Technology, United States. Her research takes place at the intersection of comparative languages and literatures, science fiction studies, as well as science and technology studies. In the meantime, Virginia is a managing editor at the Sci-Fi RA Review, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this journal, uh, its full title is the uh, Science Fiction Research Association Review. It is an open access journal. Last but not least, we have Dr. Paula Giovanni with us. She is an associate professor of modern Chinese literature in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago, United States. She is the author of Tales of Futures Past, Literature and Anticipation in Contemporary China, which was published by Stanford University Press in 2014. And this year, her co-edited volume, Sound Alignments, Popular Music in Asia's Cold Wars, just came out with, uh, from Duke University press. Um, Dr. Giovanni's current research interests include 1970s to 1980s Chinese cinema, realism in, and inequality, and contemporary speculative fiction. Before we start, I'd like to say a few words about the genesis of this panel discussion. So when AI 2041 just came out, the book aroused much controversy. Uh, because this is the first time a sci-fi writer collaborate with an AI expert, a business, uh, uh, a businessman, um, because Mr. Kai Fu Li is currently the CEO of Sinovation Ventures, um, and uh, he formerly works with Google, and he formerly also worked with Microsoft, SGI, and Apple. So. 
if you look at the, um, uh, the promotion materials of this book, you often encounter such a line, for example, this is a groundbreaking blend of imaginative storytelling and scientific forecasting. Uh, it has a good combination of a scientific explanation and a, of science fiction stories, so on and so forth. Um, and Virginia Cohn recently actually wrote a criticism of this novel. Uh, and this piece is entitled, The Tyranny of Neutrality, in AI 2041. It was published in Los Angeles Review of Books on the 30th October, 2021. Therefore, we feel it is necessary to bring together the science fiction writer and an early career researcher and uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the academics together. So we, we, we would like to offer this forum, this platform for them to have a dialogue. So now I'm going to talk a few words about our format today. I'm going to kick off our discussion by asking each panelist a question. Afterwards, uh, they will have a free discussions among themselves. For the last 30 or 40 minutes also, I will open the floor to our audience. Uh, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box. Please feel free to uh, introduce yourself. Therefore, we know how, where the questions are coming from. Okay, without further ado, let me start by inviting Stanley to introduce this new book. So what is this book about? And uh, why did you agree to do this collaborative project? The floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Lu, and thanks Mia and SOAS for having me here to have this precious opportunity. And also thanks Virginia and Paula, because I, I really uh, read through the article very uh, carefully because I, I'm kind of like agree to all this disagrees. And I think this is one of the most uh, precious opportunity that we can uh, open up and totally have a, a, a pretty much uh, inclusive uh, discussion and conversation on the book. Um, let's get back to two years ago before pandemic. So uh, because as, as you might know, like Dr. Kaifu Lee, and I came across back in the day when we both worked for Google and he came up with this idea like on this collaboration of writing a book uh, with using science fiction together with analysis to portray a positive imagination of the future AI and Thus, the, the impact of the society and individual uh, from different uh, 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 domain. So, I first of all, I have to admit, I kind of uh, hesitating for a little bit because um, no one would love to work with your ex boss on anything. I think so, but I think. Um, after the conversation, I think, like, uh, as you all see, like Dr. Kaifu Lee, he's a very successful businessman, investor, and also AI uh, scientist and, and opinion leader uh, internationally. But I have to say a lot of his ideas pretty much basic and and like uh, straightforward on how technology might influence people, no matter it's like individually or collectively. So I kind of think that maybe I can help because as a science fiction writer, all I used to do is create this kind of futuristic storytelling, uh, build up this uh, plausible scenario which embedded with all this kind of action and reaction from the characters, then like the readers are able to perceive 
what's the um, outcome, what's the uh, complex uh, interaction between human and technology and, and, and nevertheless and culture and society and history, et cetera, et cetera. So I started this kind of painful journey for almost two years because we running this project in a pretty much uh, um, like, like highly controlling way because we have to finish everything strictly uh, according to the schedule because we're gonna launch it in 2021 because I, I made up the name AI 2041 because AI to letters seems pretty much similar with uh, 41. So if you can see the font design on the cover art, so that's basically a, 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 a gameplay. So that means we have to finish 10 stories. Meanwhile, the translation and editing and all this kind of like tech analysis uh, written by Kai Fu Lee. So it's pretty much a tight schedule. So I have to say the first half year we are struggling a lot because both of us had very strong opinions of on what we exist. He's kind of in this like we have to describe the future in a very positive way, but I say there's no way we can come up with a very um, compelling and dramatic uh, storytelling. So I think afterward, we all agree, like we have to set all these 10 stories in different cultural background because that's where we can see how this technology adapted to different context because that's what I think is highly possible to happen in the future. Like different people from different society, they might totally have different opinions and attitude towards the AI as a technology. So that means a lot of like study, research, works I have to do. So across all different kind of like countries, geopolitics, history, cultures, mythologies, you can name it. So I think we are kind of like dancers, like a swinging dancing. So it's like back and forth where I'm put, pushing forward a little bit of the limit and Dr. Kaifu Lee will push backward a little bit what he wants. So I think we get to this point like kind of balancing, but still compromising, I have to admit. So, but I'm pretty happy with it because I think there's several uh, opinions from me to take on this book. So first is not only science fiction themselves or the tech analysis. So you can read from different perspective one is you can read only the stories. Another one is you can read all this knowledge base uh, essays. And third, you can read what's the divergence between the two. And you can see how two different forces like struggling against each other. So I think that's what makes the book even more interesting because you can see the purpose from different uh, people to different authors. So we're taking different approach towards the future, but we come together to agree on all this kind of disagreement. So I think there's something make me to think this book, this book is actually about go beyond the binaries. It's about how people, how individual in the future, we need to think and act beyond the binary of fear or favor between human and machine, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is something like we always need to bear in mind, like each one of us 
have our own limitation and pre assumption for sure. And, and of course, there's a lot of like uh, simplification on uh, scenarios in the book, in the story for sure. But I think that's how I gonna take it because this is only the beginning of the conversation. Because I think our story, our narrative is not only limited to the book itself, but also create with all this kind of review, critiques, discussion and debates around the book. And even it reveals much more value in time because like the change is happening like simultaneously. So I'm pretty surprised because during this process, I can see what's changed after two years, like Dr. Kai Fu Lee. So like I would say the change is in two ways. So now I think he's pretty much more open to all this kind of like, humanity issues or cultural issues. For example, like we have to shift the focus from AI as a technology to human centric. And like UBI is not enough for job displacement in the future if AI take over a lot of jobs. So we came to uh, agree that like people need more uh, more than salary, more than like basic income, but dignity, but their self actualization and their meaning of life uh, from work. So I think we get to a lot of like progress after this kind of collaborating project, which make me happy because there's like very few alternatives that you can change your boss, right? So not to mention, you can have this kind of very precious chance to um, influence a lot of policymakers and, and engineers and, 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 and scientists and, and business leaders across the world. So I think I'm totally happy for this book to coming out and receive all this kind of re response because I think this is also part of my mission to be accomplish. So I think I'll make my point here and I would love to hear um, like Mia, Virginia and Paula want to say about the book and we can unfold the discussion later. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, so my next question is for Mia, uh, because as we know, uh, when scholars study Chen Chufan's science fiction, they often evoke the concept science fiction realism. In fact, in the introduction of AI 40, uh, 2041, there is a passage I just simply, I can quote here. Uh, so it, it's written by Stanley himself. So the passage reads, to me, science fiction um, is, a fascin is fascinating because it not only generates an imaginative, imaginative space for escapists to leave behind their mundane lives, play the role of superheroes, and freely explore galaxies far, far away, but it also provides a precious opportunity for them to temporarily remove themselves from everyday reality and critically reflect upon it. So the science fiction realism is so critical. So I wonder whether you can say a few words about this concept and how it is manifested in Stanley's early works. And can we apply the same concept to his new book? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Shani. And also thanks, Dan, for giving us a bit more information about the collaboration of this whole project. And this is truly an interesting project. And I definitely agree with uh, Stan how he tried to address a variety of uh, cultures across continents, how he tries to, in his stories, involve the different groups of people with very varied social backgrounds. I think that's the part I'm quite um, like uh, impressed by this whole project. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm so glad to hear 
here, he's actually talking about how through this whole project, he's find a way to change the AI expert like, like Kai Fu Li, which is not a like easy job, and how he tries to overcome binaries uh, in um, like his stories and in many, uh, in multiple ways. Uh, I have to say, I enjoy reading the majority part of the story. And uh, as pointed out by, uh, by Xiao Ning, uh, I want to talk about science fiction realism for my part, but also more importantly, I think I want to uh, talk about how such kind of a collaboration, well, we know um, Stan kind of changed the Kai Fu Li a bit, like in some ways, but I want to talk about the other way around and how the involvement of this that such collaboration also changes science fiction realism uh, within the stories of AI 2041 in many ways, and particularly how such collaboration leads to a possible shift from science fiction realism to capitalist realism as reflect, reflected in some of the stories. So as pointed out by Xiaoning in the introduction to this book, then actually re-emphasize the concept of science fiction realism. So for those audience who has, who has not read many of Chinese sci-fi or Stan's previous work, um, science fiction realism is a concept actually first proposed by him in the context of Chinese science fiction. Uh, I think it can be said this kind of concept has guided his sci-fi writings and also has been repeatedly mentioned by himself in many, many uh, occasions. And in this introduction, he reaffirms the importance of science fiction realism. Um, so based on the studies of his early stories like With the Tide and also uh, the statements, his own statements in the introduction, uh, I try to summarize the following characteristics of the style of science fiction realism that he promotes. So I think the stories are usually set in the near future and very closely related to the real issues in contemporary life, such as environmental pollution, uh, like with Thai talk about the electronic waste pollution in a Chinese town called Huiyu, which is a real city in a real life context. And also some other issues in relation to medical ethics, controversy, and also the individual struggles of migrant workers in Chinese urban cities and so on and so forth. Um, so it is often directly related to the ongoing social, political, and the cultural issues. Um, the stories are created to reveal the multi-layers of contemporary Chinese society, but also go beyond China, um, reflecting the relationship between China and the rest of the world. Um, and more importantly, I think um, Stan usually leave his story open-ended enough to allow further critical reflections on the topics that he has depicted. I think this is a core of his science fiction realism um, in my understanding. So his stories usually conclude on a very ambiguous note, um, aspire to encourage the readers to ponder on a variety of solutions, a variety of alternatives, uh, like he wrote in the introduction of AI 24. 41 to uh, quote, step in, make change, and actively play a role in shaping reality, end of quote. Um, however, I think this new book, AI 2041, also presents some very different characteristics in terms of realism. Uh, under the collaboration with another author, with uh, influential AI experts like Kai Fu Li, um, such differences are almost predictable and understandable. But I want to talk about how these stories themselves, on the one hand, still keep um, some of the key elements of the science fiction realism, but on the other hand, unwittingly, um, possibly unwittingly reinforce what Mark Fisher defines to be capitalist realism. I find the true story from AI 2041, the golden elephant and twin sparrows particularly demonstrate how capitalism, uh, capitalist realism can transform the previous construction of sci-fi realism and how the participation of the ideas of capitalist realism can significantly diminish the critical power that sci-fi real realism usually possessed. Um, so the story of the golden elephant revolves around how AI can be used by future insurance companies. So basically they can adjust insurance plan according to the family's needs. But as a trade-off, um, as an exchange, people will have to share the data link of every family member to the AI insurance company. Uh, the parents can even make data decisions for their children. And the story itself, I think the, particularly the first half of it, actually vividly describe how easily we're intrigued 
by those traps set by data exploitation. So I think then tries really hard to actually address this kind of uh, problems arise, arising uh, from with the consumer culture, how this kind of uh, um, operation of the AI driven, a uh, data driven insurance company can manipulate the way how it perceives privacy, particularly data privacy. Um, how such data driven system also reinforce class, class hierarchy. Uh, in this story, it is the Indian caste system. So all of these parts, I feel, are still very much the familiar formula of sci-fi realism. Um, however, toward the end of the story, the plot seemed to take a very dramatic turn. It seemed the ending of the story has offered a very clear solution to all the issues that have been raised in the story. It's very unlike than the stories, um, previous stories. So the characters actually claim they need to um, become a better AI engineer to tackle all these downsides that have been raised in the story. It almost feels as if there's no way people can actually free themselves from the constraint of a data-driven life. Um, and similarly, another story, Twin Sparrow, also concludes on a note of, I would say, AI optimism. So the story depicts a future in which uh, each small child can actually have an AI companion with a very personalized package for their individual development. Um, I have a confession to make. When I read this story, I was quite, quite amazed, amazed by this kind of AI companion because um, I'm a mother of four year old. And I think, wow, this kind of AI companion can solve a lot of like issues in our daily life. And it completely transformed the conventional way of teaching and learning the children. They don't need to memorize or you know, recite lots of information they don't understand. And AI can help them to connect things very easily and identify their strengths and weakness much more accurate and probably much earlier than the human teachers. So basically you can see the story tries to address the issue like how the children's future can be predicted and interfered by algorithm basically. Um, but meanwhile, the story also touch upon how such radical reform of education system through AI can risk in destroying self-motivation creativities in some ways. Um, however, again, toward the last few pages, I feel the story takes another direction. So the twins um, who have experienced the emotional pain brought by such AI-driven education system then decide to join their AI companions together and create a new AI to um, start the game again as implied by the story. So here the story concludes on a note that technology and capitalist mode of production is the only solution to everything. So even if you want to initiate changes, you still need to firstly accept the system, become part of the system, then possibly make some modification rather than initiate some fundamental change. Um, so based on the preliminary reading of these two stories as examples, we can see how science fiction realism in AI 2041 has turned into an expression of what Mark Fisher described to be capitalist realism. I think this term, uh, through this term, Fisher really want to reveal is a widespread sense that even though capitalism is not a perfect system, it is probably the only system that can operate. So in other words, even we admit all the problems that are brought by capitalism, capitalist realism still highlights the power of capital and reinforce the idea that the innate human desire is only compatible with capitalism. Um, I think under such powerful discourse, even in those alternative worlds that envisioned by sci-fi writers, um, the driving force that keep, keeps everything running is still capital. And with the participation of AI and technology, and you can see this kind of driving force further develops into something called techno-capitalism as termed by Luis Suarez Villa. So this term refers to changes in capitalism associated with the emergence of new technology sectors, the power of corporations, and new forms of organization. The conceptualization of this kind of techno-capitalism underlines how the advance of science and technology under current global context is fundamentally catering for the further evolution of capitalism. And it is becoming, or possibly has already become, a perversive atmosphere that affects areas of literary and cultural production. Um, I guess this is why um, such collaboration between science fiction writers or creative writers in general and the very large and influential tech corporations somehow can cause worries. Because as we can tell from 
at least two stories from this book. It does demonstrate the risk in producing invisible barriers constraining thought and action. Uh, I guess the disparate treatment of the endings of the stories, of the solutions raised, as we can see from these two examples, particularly if we put them in comparison with Dan's previous stories, um, we can see how um, his pursuit of sci-fi realism under such collaboration transformed into something like the acquiescence to capitalist realism and techno-capitalism. Um, sometimes what is more worrying is even with all these negotiations like Stan just mentioned, the author can still unwittingly become an essential part of this whole process. I feel the awareness or the unfolding of such shift from sci-fi realism to capitalist realism can also help to explain why these stories themselves actually read like dystopian dark stories, but it is fundamentally still in agreement with techno-optimism because capitalist realism is inherently anti-utopian. It holds the um, view that no matter the flaws, there's no way out, there's no alternative. And this is the only possible means of operation. I think this explains, even though these stories address the issue of data exploitation or you know, other dystopian scenario, they lack that power to criticize the present reality. Um, back to the introduction Stan wrote for this book, he explains how his stories attempt to challenging the usual dystopian AI narratives, and he wants to create some different stories. Some stories may not be entirely utopian or dystopian. Um, however, the outcome is that the stories from AI 2041, um, from, from my understanding, appear to be more of a reflection of symptoms only, but somehow avoid to challenge or probe into the fundamental cause, probably because of this collaboration. So we can see the discrepancy here. Even though the story themselves cannot be considered to be entirely techno-optimistic, and the author is probably not techno-optimistic, they can be utilized um, to reinforce the status quo and prevent the happening of the fundamental change. So I guess this is my preliminary reading of this book, and I look forward to hearing other panelists' um, viewpoints on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mia, for sharing your reading uh, with us. Uh, I've also read uh, Virginia's reaction to the book. Um, it's a very pro provocative piece on Rosanger's review of books. I was struck by the very first line of your review, um, which you already present the dialectic relationship between science fiction and uh, technological developments. Uh, so I wonder whether you can elaborate on your uh, criticism in this review. Great, thank you everyone so much for having me. Thank you to SOAS China Institute and to Mia for setting up this panel in the first place. And thank you Stan for writing this in the first place and giving us an opportunity to have this discussion today. Um, so, it, you know, I think that my role here really is to address the criticisms that I had toward this book uh, originally that cost the panel. Um, I have to say, you know, I think as many of us here have read Stan's work in the past and enjoyed it very much, um, the criticism is not at all leveled at his skill as an author or, you know, imagination for the future. Um, but as Mia also pointed out, a lot of his previous work has been very deeply suspicious of technology. Uh, I think it's been very open to um, ambiguity and possibilities for development. Uh, but many of the stories here in AI 2041 really represented more of this capitalist realism that several of the panelists have already touched on. The idea that we have to accept the system as it is, and this idea that reinforces the fact that human desires and actions are only possible under this system of technological capitalism as presented in AI 2041. So maybe let me give a very, very brief overview again of the project for those of you who haven't had an opportunity to read it yet, which is the AI 2041, my copy, um, is a collection of 10 short stories written by Stan that are science fictional in aspect and uh, take place 
either in or before 2041. The title is very literal, as he already pointed out in his own introduction. Uh, Kaifu Lee writes that all of the technologies presented in here, he thinks, have an 80% possibility of taking place in the next 20 years. Um, and that the science fiction stories depict some aspect of AI, uh, whether that's you know machine learning or automated driving systems or smart cities, smart homes, the Internet of Things. Um, you know, AI covers quite a few individual topics. Um, and then Kaifu Lee wrote a follow-up explanation to each short story, explaining the state of the field, you know, where the technology is right now and then providing his ideas about how it will continue to develop over the next 20 years. And really what makes a project like this possible at all, and what also I think really at heart is the source of all this controversy, is the role that both of these authors play. So Kaifu Lee, as you know, uh, Professor Liu already pointed out, is one of the foremost proponents of AI technology in the world today. Um, you know, he occupies a very prestigious place in terms of the business world and artificial intelligence products. Whereas Stan is routinely recognized in the Chinese press and international press as a prophet of AI. Um, he talks himself about how he writes scientific fiction, not necessarily science fiction. Um, and this idea that Stan has like this unique insight into the realities of the world and the hard material development that it's going to undergo is really central and critically important to the framing of AI 2041 as a text that accurately presents uh, and predicts future developments in AI. The, this is less speculative and more, uh, um, you know, an idea that this is how things will be. This is how they are now, and this is how they will continue to develop over the next 20 years. And as a result of the authority that these two figures imbue the book with, this text, um, I really came away from it feeling like I had three major objections to the text as a project as a whole. So I want to lay this out really quick and then I'll go back and touch on them a little bit more. Um, those of you who have already read my review are going to be familiar with these ideas, um, but I'll explain them a bit. Uh, the first is that the text really frames human behavior as a problem that can be and should be solved with technology. Um, the second is that it treats artificial intelligence products as if they are value neutral and that they're only good or bad depending on the people who are using them. So again, there's that uh, human behavior as the problem. And then the final one, and I think this is my most um, stringent problem with it, is that this text really naturalizes the products that are on the market currently um, and forecloses other possibilities. So going back to my first issue that I wanted to raise, which is that um, this idea of human behavior as the problem and artificial intelligence as a solution to the problem of human behavior. Uh, Mia already discussed this idea of technological optimism and technological solutionism. And this is a term that was originally coined by tech writer um, Evgeny Morozov to describe the idea that um, these complex social phenomena, uh, so things like politics, education, uh, healthcare, 
uh, relationships can really be understood as uh, you know, measurable problems with definite and computable, that's the important part, solutions. Um, and that we can optimize these social phenomenon if we have the correct algorithms, if we can turn them into data points, then we can solve for inefficiency in some capacity. Um, and so this really, this technological solutionism shifts our entire understanding of the world and redefines things about human behavior, um, like inefficiency or relationship problems as problems with technological solutions. Um, so when we understand the world in this way, then technology really can only ever be uh, a tool without any value of its own. Uh, again, good or bad, it's that the behavior is what's good or bad. So we see this shift towards a neutral technological solutionism in quite a few of these stories. But one of the ones that Mia brought up several times and which also really stuck out to me was Twin Sparrows. And you know, for those of you who haven't read it, Twin Sparrows talks about these two twins, um, Silver Sparrow and Gold Sparrow, who um, get artificial AI companions. But one of the central issues in the story is that uh, Silver Sparrow is autistic and his behavior poses a problem for his brother and the people around him. Um, and the story presents an AI companion as the appropriate solution to this. And you know, that makes sense in a text that is all about how artificial intelligence can help us, uh, but it doesn't take into account the idea that this behavior is only a problem in a system that views it as a problem. Rather than reassessing our kinship structures, rather than reassessing the way that society itself responds to uh, what it considers non-normative behavior, uh, we can throw a technological solution at it and then we don't have to deal with it anymore. Um, and so this promise of AI technology as a solution uh, really not only addresses the issue now redefined as a problem in itself, but also redefines all of human behavior as a problem that can be solved through the application of technology. Um, and so this really leads into my next point, which is the idea that AI itself is value neutral. Um, and this is something that the authors mention explicitly in the text. This isn't something that um, you, know, you can infer by reading it. Um, Lee Kaifu Lee several times describes AI as an objective technology, one that only acquires ethical value through its use by humans. And you know, this is a very popular idea in technological innovation spheres, and it's just simply a wrong idea. Um, you know, technologies, especially AI technologies, are developed by private corporations. Their IP holdings are heavily guarded, and it's often impossible uh, to discover how a particular artificial intelligence system or algorithm was designed in the first place, what data set or corpus it draws its information from, or how it works at all. Um, one of the uh, stories that has also been mentioned several times was the golden elephant, which uh, addresses this explicitly. And I think even Kaifu Li in his explanation talks about how by training it on this data set from the outset, this artificial intelligence insurance algorithm is already using 
biased data because it can only draw from historical connections. Um, you know, so when the predicted outcomes or patterns that replicate human biases are part of the original data, then the algorithm itself recreates systemic and repeatable errors that perpetuate this discrimination. Uh, so you could argue, as I think Lee would, that uh, if it were somehow trained on objective data, data that didn't correspond to the real world, then the technology itself would also somehow be neutral or objective. But that once again, reframes all problems as problems inherent to humans, not problems with the technology. So once again, uh, there's this shift towards humans being problems to be managed with the application of neutral or objective technologies. And so what ends up happening in the course of this book is that uh, Stan and Lee posit that if there is a problem in society, then some form of AI will solve it. And if another problem comes up in the process of this, well, then that's the fault of the human developers or the users or the data that it was trained on, not the technology itself. So if AI does something good, it's because AI is good. But if AI does something bad, no, it didn't. The user did or the data, the human data that it was based upon did. Um, so AI becomes this kind of abstract object in this sense. You know, it can only do good because it's neutral and because it's neutral, it can't do bad because the data it's trained on is bad. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Virginia. I think you summarized okay. so well about your, uh, your point, your argument, the neutral, the tyranny of the neutrality. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think all the debates surrounding around the AI 2041 really shows this is a literary event. It's not a single literary text. So I'm going to turn over to uh, Paula because as literature scholars, um, very often we pay attention to social historical context. Uh, we look at literary institutions, editorial practices, etc. So for this specific project, what is your view? How should we view the context of AI 2041? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, um, Tufan, for, um, for writing this book and for sharing your thoughts about it. Thank you to Mia for organizing this uh, panel. Uh, Xiaoning and Virginia, thank you so much. Um, I've been struggling with this book for some time now. I learned about it by kind of randomly. Um, I wrote about science fiction in my book, but then I wasn't really, I was, my focus was somewhere else. And then this summer I thought, oh, I, I should start rereading, <laughs> quite belatedly, rereading some contemporary science fiction. And I started from uh, Chen Xiu Fan's uh, early work, and then naturally I got into these more recent work, and um, and I've I've been struggling with it uh, because because of all these issues that we've been discussed, and I think Mia and Virginia really put it very very um, clearly the kinds of criticism I also have uh, in mind. So I don't mean to repeat what they said, but uh, one general question. So Xiaoning asked me about context. Well. Um, I was thinking about authorship in particular, right? And uh, you guys have been talking about this collaboration. And one question that um, literary scholars have asked for a long time, like, hmm, does what we know about the authors affect our reading? Or should what we know about the authors, should it affect our reading? Um, so we know a lot about Chen Chufan, and but I want to say a little bit more about Kai Fu Li. We already talked about him, Dr. Kai Fu Li, AI expert, for, former president of Google China, author of another book about AI, AI superpowers, and CEO of this company of uh, Sinovision Ventures. And so I would I would just briefly like to say, what is what exactly is Sinovision Ventures? 
Uh, the website tells us that it is a leading Chinese technology venture capital started in 2009 with presence in Beijing, Shanghai, Nanjing, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen. And then the website goes on to say, we currently manage $2.7 billion in assets under management. AUM, I was not familiar with this term. I'm so totally ignorant of finance. So 2.7 assets under management between 10 US dollars and uh, renminbi funds in total, 10 funds in total, over 400 portfolio companies across the technology spectrum in China. So elsewhere, I've seen the company described as a full service venture capital firm that actively invests in Chinese technology market, particularly in the areas of healthcare technologies, artificial intelligence, robotics automation, and digital lifestyle. So we can see here that the areas in which Sinovation Ventures invests um, partly correspond with the topics uh, dealt with, the topics covered in AI in 2041. So as I'm sure that you know better than I do, venture capital is a kind of financing that investors provide to small businesses and startup companies that are believed to have long-term growth potential. So somewhat oversimplifying, the goal of sign of venture and ventures is to convince you that AI is the next big thing in which to invest. And at the same time, to create the conditions for the AI industry to continue to expand so that investors like you can profit from it, or like me, if I had the money. So telling stories of how future markets will evolve seems to be a crucial tool to realize the goal of Sinovation Ventures. Such stories as the one in AI 2041 then they're not just meant to entertain or to educate us. They are designed to directly shape the market so, so that certain investments are successful. These stories can become, if they work as intended by the authors, self-fulfilling prophecies. So AI in 2041 presents the expansion of machine learning or of artificial intelligence in general as in, in, inevitable inevitable fact. As a literary scholars and somewhat repeating what Mia said, I'm very tempted to re relate this rhetoric of ine inevitability to the rhetoric of socialist realism. Socialist realism was the preferred aesthetic mode in socialist countries, and it consisted of representing reality not as it actually was, but as it was becoming, or as it was allegedly progressing toward socialism. So the task of the socialist writers was to narrate the movement of history toward socialism, which would supposedly bring with it freedom, equality, and happiness for the great majority of humanity. As Mia mentioned, the late Mark Fisher coined the term capitalist realism, and we could perhaps call AI in 2041 venture capitalist realism, for it seemingly describes reality not as it actually is, but as it is allegedly becoming or will soon be. And moreover, and moreover it claims that this brave, new, this brave new world laying ahead will bring enormous benefit to the whole of humanity. And this is the socialist pitch in capitalist realism. As a literary scholar, we tend to worry about the complicities of literature with systems of power but I cannot think of any other book that wants to be read as literature and at the same time is so directly instrumental to the expansion of a particular form of capitalism, the form that Shoshana Zuboff has called surveillance capitalism and that she defines as the new economic order that claims human experience as a free new raw material for hidden commercial practices of extraction, predictions and sales. AI in 2041 presents us with various scenarios. And again, what is not in question here is the storytelling talent of Chen Chiu Fan that really transpires from this work, from, from these stories. Um, but the book tells us very, very little about AI's environmental and labor costs. 
and about the consequences of all kinds of extraction. So I beg your pardon, but I think for me, this book has been very valuable because it really made me aware of how we are caught in this system of surveillance capitalism and of the need to read more and to understand more about it. So one book that I, I'm still reading now is this one, and I would like to recommend it to everyone, Kate Crawford, Atlas of AI. And I just, let me read just one brief, um, sorry, I lost the place where I was. Um, okay, why? Okay, in this book, I argue that AI is neither artificial nor intelligent. Rather, artificial intelligence is both embodied and material, made from natural resources, fuel, human labor, infrastructures, logistics, histories, and classifications. AI systems are not autonomous, rational, or able to discern anything without extensive computationally intensive training with large data sets or predefined rules and rewards. In fact, artificial intelligence as we know it depends entirely on a much wider set of political and social structures. And due to the capital required to build AI at scales and the way of, ways of seeing it, it optimizes, AI systems are ultimately designed to serve existing dominant interests. In this sense, artificial intelligence is a registry of power, and it's about these inequalities of power that we need to learn about, and that uh, uh, even AI 2041 doesn't talk about them, but it's a stepping stone to read more broadly around these issues. So thank you so much for, uh, and I'm really um, looking forward to discussion with the people who are here in attendance. Oh, thank you so much, Paula, for the, uh, your wonderful stimulating remarks. I think it really brings in different strengths of critical investigation together. And time flies very fast, and now we're hitting three o'clock. So I'd like to open the floor to our audience. And so if you can type your questions in the Q&A box, I will really appreciate it. While we are waiting, I actually, I already have a comment uh, from Emily Jim. Emily Jing is currently uh, a PhD candidate at Yale University, and she is also the translator of AI 2041. And I think um, uh, I have a quite long comment from Emily, but it's really, really interesting. And um, for example, she talks about at many Chinese science fiction events, one of the biggest questions that our writers and the translators often get asked is what makes Chinese science fiction Chinese? But the AI 2041 provides a new response. Uh, so according to Emily and science fiction or rather scientific fiction in this case can be written by Chinese writers without having to be labeled as Chinese. And then um, Emily particularly points out the, the multiple boundary crossings and um, especially calls attention to the role of the translator. And we, we not only have collaboration between the, the writer and the AI expert, but also collaboration uh, between them and uh, Emily. Uh, so for instance, she elaborates, she said, in the process of writing, uh, in the process of writing with Stanley in producing the translation, there was a lot of back and forth between him, the writer, and I, the translator, Kai Fu Li, who is perfectly bilingual, and the book's English editors. So most of those conversations happened in multiple languages, the Chinese language and the English language, tech jargon, rhetorical devices, and the everyday speech to make the concepts accessible to the layman. The production of this book it itself merits close analysis because it breaks down traditional roles in creative publishing and the boundaries between writer, translator, and the editor are blurred. There is no longer a single authority. So I think this is quite nicely echoes to Paula's question um, remarks on the authorship. So who are the authors here? Um, 
I wonder any panelists want to address this, uh, have any comments or your response to this question? Or if you have any other questions you want to raise to each other, please go ahead. I just want to say that, yeah, the, the issue of the translation is very remarkable in this case because and the question of languages, because uh, I think Kai Fu Li wrote directly in English, right? Whereas uh, Chen Xiufan was writing in Chinese and was being translated at the same time. And so I apologize. I, I feel that we have to apologize to the translator for not mentioning that because the translator is often really the invisible labor that is uh, kind of uh, neglecting. So my sincere apologies for that. No, I, I don't yeah, actually I, see the translator's name on the book cover. So I was quite surprised, to be honest, because yeah. I also have a copy. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's really, really bad. And I really feel very bad about it, about this erasure of the labor of the translator. At the same time, though, I want to be cautious about all this vocabulary that we constantly use, like overcoming boundaries and I mean, in the end, we have also to ask ourselves what's good about overcoming boundaries? I mean, what's the ultimate goal? And I, I still strongly believe that the ultimate goal of this work is advertisement and kind of uh, propagating and naturalizing a, a way of thinking that's felt as dominant. It's a narrative of the winners. And in that sense, I want to be careful that our rhetorics that we like to use in the humanities of overcoming binaries and boundaries doesn't, you know, doesn't, to ask ourselves, why is that good? Well, and I, if I could jump in there really quick. Um, hi, Emily. Um, you know, I think that in many ways, actually, the fact that the work of the translators is hidden from this book, you know, it's not on the cover. I think that, you know, there were multiple translators for it, Emily, Andy, um, I don't remember everyone, but the fact that this labor is in, that brought this product together and is indispensable to the final product uh, really is analogous in many ways with how AI itself functions to make the human labor invisible. Um, we see this final product at the end that we attribute to, um, you know, Stan himself and Kai Fu Li. And it was this back and forth, you know, projection between the editors, the translators and everything. But at the end, it's not really about the quality of the writing, which is spectacular as always. I think that no one here has any uh, problems with the writing, the translation, um, you know, the descriptions. It's what is this book trying to do? And how do the positions of the two authors make this a credible project? Because I really do think that so much of this is due to the fact that Stan is a prophet of, you know, scientific and social development and Kai Fu Li is an expert in AI. I feel like if anyone else wrote this, we would not be reacting to it the same way. Um, this, this project is presented as a fact, a scientific fact of development. And that's what so much of this controversy revolves around. Yeah, I echo with uh, Paula and Virginia just said, I think translator definitely should be better acknowledged like Emily and, and also all the other translator. But I also want to bring awareness of another um, translation. Maybe we didn't pay that much attention. Um, the translation in Kai Fu Li's notes and analysis, which I find quite interesting um, because Stan mentioned like we can read the stories just themselves. We don't need to read the analysis or notes. We can separate the stories from this analysis. Um, um, but when you actually separate the stories and then afterwards, if you go back to read all this analysis, I find like uh, there's a very clear intention of uh, translating some very serious issues. 
like data exploitation that has been addressed in the story into something much less serious in this kind of analysis. For example, AI can be better trained or um, the purpose is how we should um, like monitor the use of technology rather than abuse technology. So I think this kind of process of translating something very serious or you know real, real dangers into something less serious actually um, I think remind me of uh, the German sociologist Alice Beck uh, defines to be like organized irresponsibility. This also echo with Virginia's comments on the neutrality of uh, AI, how AI, uh, there's no wrongdoing of AI, and also echo with Paula's um, um, comments on the context, on the very complete context. So I think the organized irresponsibility um, is really to reveal two things that we often overlook. So like the policymaker and the large corporations scientists and other groups of influential people, basically, they can form a very powerful alliance to translate some very serious issues into something much less serious. And these issues are actually created by themselves at the beginning. But the creation of such kind of like a uh, discourse called risk discourse uh, is help them to abdicate their responsibility in creating all these problems from the beginning. And then they claim these consequences are inevitable in the development of human society. Um, I feel like the involvement of the creative writers and translators somehow a bit unfair because they do kind of committed a lot of like their intelligence and the works, but often kind of unwittingly involved in such a process of organized irresponsibility. And the second key message about this term, I think is how um, this very same group of um, people, like influential uh, individuals and companies, basically the people in the society who are in power, then claim they are able to offer solutions to these issues, to monitor and minimize um, all these risks. So I think in the name of uh, helping us to tackling all these issues, they stand in an even more powerful position to define what is right or wrong, what is amendable and what is inevitable. Um, I think this comes back to the question of authorship. Uh, I feel like it's a very compli complicated process of involving authors, translators, and all other um, people. And they kind of all be unwittingly involved in such process of forming a organized um, irresponsibility, which I think uh, we probably, not only for this project, but also for the future collaborations between um, creative writers and translation and all the other people. But I do feel like it's very good, like um, they, you know, Chinese sci-fi writers not only write about China, but also about the rest of the world, but there's definitely some um, con context we need to further discuss on that. Okay, thank you, Mia. Uh, I think we have a question coming in, so I'm going to read it out. As a commercial writer, so this is from Ian Oe. Oh, sorry if I promise your <laughs> name incorrectly. As a commercial writer or a writer who is trying to survive mostly on writing myself, I would like to raise the issue of marketability of literature, which determines a writer's career path. As a researcher as well, I'm curious what the panel thinks about the job a writer who has to write palatable and a sellable fiction in order to maintain a healthy career, which this book or project clearly offers an opportunity. Any of you? Right, I can take that um, briefly and maybe uh, Mia, Virginia and Paula can jump in later. So first of all, I, I think I, I, I need to apologize for didn't have all these translators name uh, appear properly because I I tried quite a few times to have them be recognized on a pretty much appropriate position. For example, on the cover in the uh, table of context, et cetera, et cetera. But obviously I don't own the biggest fucking power in this project. So I have to admit that um, because I wrote in Chinese and be translated into English and Kaifu wrote in English and be translated into Chinese later on in, in, in different uh, editions. So I think like both of us like take advantage from uh, all these labors from uh, translators. So I think I, I, I have to apologize for that. And, and for Yen's uh, question, I think you make a very good points that is 
it is indeed very difficult to sell books, especially uh, literacy books, and not not to mention like uh, 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 a translation in English market because, uh, as everyone knows, is like totally dominant market for English writers and books. So I think before three body problem, nobody want to translate or read or buy any kind of books, especially from China as a genre of science fiction. So I think that's totally something we have to bear in mind. And I think this have to say, I have to admit this project is kind of pretty much commercial and you can see, and. I think Virginia and Paula make their point very clearly and powerfully enough to convince me that I previously mentioned the change is two way. So I'm also be changed during this process of collaboration because all you, uh, all you mentioned uh, all these kind of issues in the storytelling and between the storytelling and the tech analysis is, uh, is it is exist for sure. It's it's there, so I think this book is kind of a very uh, representative uh, schizophrenia symptom of uh, capitalism, as Deleuze uh, put it. So yeah, I think this book helped me to get much more exposure in the market. So yeah, so so. From that perspective, I think it helps me a lot to write whatever I would love to write in the future. And for sure, I totally agree with you on the neutrality of technologies and also AI is not the ultimate solution for all this kind of issue we tap into. But for this book at the very beginning is positioning is like this, right? So everyone has to accept it. So I think I did what I can to keep the balance and play this sophisticated enough game to uh, around all these kind of different issues and 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 humanity and and, and social and cultural uh, uh, issues there. But I think there's still more to be explore for sure. So I think, yeah, this, all you mentioned is a perfect material and starting point for my next book. Actually, it will be sequels of Waste Tide. So there'll be two more books. So I'm, I'm currently working on that. So it actually tapping to all the questions you just mentioned, like the the kind of capitalism and the possible outcome, but definitely not AI. So I, I think maybe tap into the field of spirituality and Gaia for sure. So I think that's something, it's like a parallel project I'm doing like in the past two years, I did a lot of few studies. So for, uh, in, in, uh, for the minorities people and also shamanism, so I think totally that's something didn't fully review in this book, AI 2041, but I keep all this kind of thinking and uh, research for my next few books because they are all belong to myself and it's all solo. So I'm pretty happy that you, you pointed out and I think it's pretty much a good uh, sign um, to keep me uh, aware of how, as a writer, as an independent writer, how to stay uh, sober and not to be kidnapped by the venture capital or whatsoever capital. So I think this is something maybe each one of these authors might face because it's so difficult as a writer, especially science fiction writer, to make a living out of writing. So I think Yan might agree with me. And I think we all need to find a way to balancing uh, what we really would love to write and what the market might 
would love to read and buy. So I think there's something everyone struggling with, but I'm pretty happy that today we're pretty, pretty much open up and to all this kind of discussion and conversation. Thank you. Thank you for your candid, uh, very candid response. Uh, it just reminds me of some Chinese filmmakers. They would um, maybe make one commercial film and make enough money and then to realize their dream of make their art film. So right. yeah, I see the parallels there. Right. <laughs> Anybody else wants to respond or any questions among yourselves? Oh, I will have another one coming in, great. Uh, this one is from Varsha Gupta. Hi, this discussion today has been amazing. I'm currently a master's student studying international politics and I had a question since it's close to my dissertation topic. Could you talk more about how feminism will be explored in the sequels? Chen Qiufan, Stanley, are you going to explore right. feminism in your sequels? Yeah, for sure. I think I didn't do it quite good enough in the first one. So because it was uh, written 10 years ago, actually. So I think uh, in the sequels, uh, there will be still a female protagonist. And we're gonna, I think the girl power will be the dominant uh, narrative in the books, uh, Force Coming. And also we, we gonna talk about like how this kind of gender issue uh, appear in the cyberspace, because right now we're talking about metaverse, crypto world, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that the problem is not solved there like virtually it's not naturally so, but maybe it will transform to a, another like uh, appearance, appearance and maybe it's much more uh, invisible and also the exploitation is invisible there as well. So I think many things and, and also like technology as a, a, a way of uh, committing uh, violence, especially uh, slow violence, is pretty much uh, a, a, a topic I wanna discuss because in the previous book, actually we rewrote a part of the violence scene uh, with using introduced technology as a medium, but it made me to think, is it like to soften the violence or to strengthen the violence itself. So I think that's a question we have to think very cautiously because right now we're experiencing this kind of extreme discourse and behavior across the social media. I think for everyone of who experienced those uh, traumatizing uh, issue, my admit is much more violence than the physical uh, harms. So I think that's something I would love to discuss in the in, in the next two books as well. Thank you. Um, I had a comment and then a question. One is, um, yeah, I really appreciated the question of that um, of, of of the writer who asked about market. I don't have any answer, but I just want to say that I appreciate the the struggle and also I want to reflect on the fact that we are caught somehow. I mean, we are communicating thanks to in some ways, thanks to some, some aspect of artificial intelligence. And also we're caught in the system and in a way we complain to our author that is not being critical enough. And then they say, oh, don't worry, I'll be critical in the next. Um, it's all. It's. I just want to want to register a kind of awkwardness uh, in this, right? Because we we have a desire for critique in a way. We have um, we have a desire for the critique of the system in which we live, and that desire is part of the system itself. And in the end, the critique will, will be part of the system itself. So, I just want to register that we are always circulating within. A certain system, and it seems that the way to flourish in it 
is to alternate. The way to flourish in this system is to be a little bit with the system and a little bit against the system. And then we are the most successful uh, in the system. So again, there's no way out, but I just want to, want to express my, I don't know, sense of I'm a little bit despair. But uh, finally, I had one very practical question that is, if I'm not mistaken, the book AI 2041 was launched more or less simultaneously or maybe first in English and then in Chinese. And is it true that it was published in Chinese only in non-simplified characters? And if you can tell us a little bit about the publishing a release process in, in Chinese and if there is a version in simplified characters. Obviously right. this is part of the question. Right, so uh, for now we have traditional Chinese edition coming out in July and English in both uh, US and UK market uh, coming out in September but there's no concrete plan for simplified Chinese edition yet. But um, I couldn't get into much detail, but it tapped into the feel like everyone supposed to understand, uh, especially those who have uh, publishing uh, publication experience in mainland China. So I think the problem is not on my side so but we'll see because there's nothing sensitive there in the book if you have read a, a content so it's pretty interesting because if like ultimately the rest of the world can read a book but besides uh, simplified chinese market that would be another performance art i have to say and it's making it more interesting. And, and I think there'll be more study around it. So I, I, I don't think that's gonna happen, but yeah, we'll see because next year there'll be a lot of uh, big events happening in China. So yeah, we'll see. But yeah, I agree like as Paula mentioned, um, like each author should like stick to what they believe in and not to compromise whether like for on collaboration or like solo uh, writings. But I think one thing I've learned from um, Dao De Jing, so uh, from thousand years ago is like, um, you have to be like water. So it's not directly or, or go against something your enemy stand for, but I think is to regularly to reshape the, their roots, to change the position in a much more silent way. So that's what I believe in and maybe you can, call it like kind of compromise. But I think this is something I've learned to uh, in my previous experience in the society. So I think, yeah, so, but still agree to disagree. And I wish, yeah, next time, yeah, it could be something more powerful and more criticized about what I really believe in. Great, thank you so much for your answer. Uh, I think I, I'd like to follow up Paula's observation. And I actually, I, I'm quite inspired by um, Virginia's review. I think Virginia mentions, maybe someday we wouldn't even need to turn to find Stanley Chan. There will be AI version of Stanley Chan, uh, analyzing all the, you know, all your, all your writing style, et cetera. Maybe this AI writer can, present a social critique, and that would be even more despairing for us. Um, yeah, I think we have time for one more question for either from our audience members or from our panelists. One more question, the last one. Uh, if no one is asking question for now, maybe I want to raise uh, one question for Stan. I think we can all agree our criticism or discussion today is not for you. 
because we all agree like the stories are beautifully written and you've done your part to negotiate with a very powerful system. But in the meantime, I'm tr I, I want to bring out uh, the, the context as Paula said is very complicated for contemporary Chinese writers. And also there's participation of the states um, expectation basically like how uh, Chinese government and the state trying to um, consider Chinese sci-fi as a, a new cultural export. So you are also dealing with all these people from the state and from the uh, different kinds of state-owned agency. And in the meantime, in the mainland China, you also have to deal with uh, a very variety of groups of um, people. And I want to know how do you think of this kind of complex context and not only for yourself, but for other Chinese sci-fi writers, um, how do you position yourself and how do you um, deal with this kind of like com com uh, intricacy basically? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I think um, I'm not, I'm not that kind of pure writer, writer. So I'm, 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 I'm like a complex. So I, I used to work for tech giants and have, I have uh, multiple uh, identities. So I think what I've learned um, from like uh, maintaining all this kind of different uh, identity is like you have to, like you have to understand uh, what people want to listen to. So you you should adapt to the language they uh, used to uh, accept. So I think that's the most effective way to make the conversation and, and to achieve whatever goal you want to achieve. So I think because all of different parties here from the government, from the private sector, from the university and from the mass audience, they all have different expectation on science fiction, I have to say. And maybe either one of their expectation fell into the, 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 this kind of super broad spectrum of how science fiction could be defined and function as a genre. So I think totally it requires a lot of efforts and wisdom to, to make the balance because as a writer, you always have something to say from the very bottom of your heart. So that's something you totally believe in. But meanwhile, you couldn't like 100% represent what you truly want to write, right? So, so I think that's, for example, in, in the States, there are so many uh, PC, political correctness there. So you couldn't write anything as freely as you, you want. So I think there's something pretty much common uh, exists all around the world. So we have to learn this kind of grassroots uh, wisdom from the street light. You have to be adaptive and you have to play step by step very cautiously to move forward and until, but you have to keep that roadmap in mind because you know there's some ultimate goal there is to deliver the message you want to say. So that's something you don't want to forget. So to me it's like missionary, that's something you have to tolerance and you have to sacrifice a lot, even like being yourself. So I think that's something pretty different from those who say, I just write what I want to say. I'm, I'm a true writer. So I'm not that kind of person a claim I'm a true writer. I think I'm not. So, but maybe I can stay, I can stand longer because I can witness and observe what's going on. Okay, the, thank you so much. Paula, do you want to make a quick yep. response? Well, yeah, I find it difficult to imagine us as completely separate from the context and, you know, I have something and then there is the, I mean, this, this, this notion of, you know, me and the world, I've, I think in very different terms from what Chiofan just expressed, but I totally respect what you just expressed. And let me ask you an, a last question if you want to answer it. We only have two minutes. Okay. Most fundamentally what do you think is it in the bottom of your heart that you hope to achieve 
through science fiction? I think it's about it's about how we need to coexist with others, not only about like other cultures, other nations, but other species. So I think that's something we have to get rid of our ego. So I think that's the only exit for human being as a civilization can maintain our existence on this planet. So I think that's the ultimate message I would love to deliver. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, we are right on time. Thank you again for all the panelists for your wonderful participation. Also, I'd like to thank all our audience members for being here today on Friday afternoon, your precious 90 minutes. You give us your precious 90 minutes. So thank you all. Okay, bye.